because I I was not I was not really adapting to the new environment I was in. I was taking the stories that I had learned in the UK and I was using them to navigate China. And China is very different. And I, I one day I was having a very very bad day. Welcome to the Change Lead, the podcast providing leaders with the insight needed to get things done in a rapidly changing and complex world. Subscribe to this podcast so you don't miss an episode. Connect with our community of like-minded leaders on our website, thechangelead.com. Welcome to The Change Lead with your host, Babatope Ipiyumi. Great leaders are great communicators. Great communicators use stories to communicate and inspire people. Can we all become great communicators? Can we all learn to use stories to inspire change? To discuss this with me is Jamie Dixon. Jamie is a coach, trainer, and author. Jamie is the author of three books. He's worked with ambitious leaders from over 160 multinational companies. In his latest book, The Story Habit, Jamie shares a methodology for influencing at work through the power of storytelling. So, today, Jamie and I will have a conversation on how to inspire change through storytelling. Hi, Jamie. Really glad to have you on the show today, and I'm really looking forward to today's conversation. It's really good to be with you today, and thank you for having me. Perfect. Perfect. Um, so to get started, um, I've noticed you've been very busy in podcast land. There are a lot of <laughs> you got you got a lot of podcasts going on. Um, there, there's a phrase from one of your conversations that got really got my attention. You said a story is always about change, right? mm. and given what I do, given the fact that I you know I, I work in change, speak and talk on change, the podcast about change and leadership. Mm. Uh, that really got my attention. So, so to get started, let's start from there. Why is mm. storytelling so powerful? Um, mm. What is it about storytelling that makes it so powerful? Mm. Well, I, I think that word um, that you mentioned, change, is what makes storytelling so powerful. Because when we think of the word storytelling, we typically think of someone standing on stage telling a story or a movie or, or reading a novel or something. But another way of thinking about story is the stories that shape our beliefs and our mindset and our way of thinking and our understanding of the world. And so we, we have stories about absolutely everything. We have stories about our role in society. We have stories about uh, our business. We have stories about how relationships work in our family and so on. And the reason storytelling is so important is because, firstly, we use these stories to navigate our way around the world. But then the world changes and our stories need to change to adapt to the world. So, for example, uh, a change everyone has been through in the last few years is working from home. The story used to be that you, you know, you get on the subway, you do your commute, you go to the office, you have your meetings in the office, and then all of a sudden you can't do any of that anymore. And so you then have to update your stories. And, and so life in life, there are a lot of changes that happen. And, and when these changes happen, we need to update our stories to fit the new changed context. And one shortcut to achieve that is actually to hear the stories of others. And we, we are really, really interested in the experiences of others when they're told in a story format, because they're about the changes that they've been through and the changes that we might go through in, in the future as well. And so when we hear their stories, we can take lessons from their stories without having to experience the pain of that kind of change ourselves. And, you know, if I if I give uh, a, an example, I remember just at the beginning of the pandemic. So back in March 2020, um, this was when the UK was going on lockdown. And 
in Shanghai, you know, we we hadn't really had a serious lockdown. We've maybe spent a few weeks mostly at home and, and that was it. And I remember being on a call with people from the UK and I'm sharing my experience with them about, <laughs> you know, this is what lockdown is like. And, you know, they're, they're getting some tips from that. And then, you know, later on, the, the roles were kind of reversed when Shanghai went into lockdown. Uh, but to simply answer your question, it, the reason story is so important is because it's about change and we go through changes, whether we like them or not. And we need to update our stories to fit those changes. And one way of doing that is by learning from the stories of others. So storytelling gets really, really meta <laughs> in this way. <laughs> no, that, that's quite quite insightful, actually. Interesting that you have to update your stories because you could have a story that's no longer fit for the context. So you need to understand how do you deal with that and how do you change your story so it makes sense. I think it's, it's a very good example. And the example you gave there about what happened during COVID-19 is, is such that the whole world went through it. So we all can relate to it in one way. The expressions might be different, but there's a story you can all relate to and orientate towards that. So that, that's quite, quite good, actually. Um, so definitely because of change, storytelling is so powerful. Now, if we can try and tease that out with an example. So based mm. on your, your book, The Story Habit, um, mm. what, we're looking, what, we, what we need leaders to do is to actually use storytelling to inspire action. Okay. So how do mm -hmm. we harness the power of storytelling so leaders can say, okay, we now understand that storytelling is so powerful. How can we harness this power and use it to inspire change, whether it's in mm -hmm. a business, whether it's in, in an organization, it, it, even could, it could be within the family. How do you inspire change? So are there any examples you can use to tease out this powerful um, use of storytelling uh, or when mm -hmm. leaders have, have been able to do that and inspire change? Mm. So uh, one example that comes to my mind is a, a German guy I was coaching uh, a while ago, and <clears throat> he, his job was to go and inspect uh, safety standards in, in factories here in China, where I'm based. And um, if you've ever been to a factory in China, uh, you know that the workers, they don't really care about safety. They just care about getting the job done so they can finish their shift and go off and play games on their phone and have a cigarette. And so the company, this German guy was representing, um, I'll, I'll call him Kevin. His company had very, very, very strict standards for, for safety. And so it, it's the simplest things. Like if you want to change a light bulb, you need to use a ladder. Uh, and you need to make sure there's someone watching you like that level of, of 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 strictness. So I remember he was telling me he went to the factory and he saw a factory worker place a stool on a table and he was standing on the stool on the table, reaching out and it looked really, really dangerous. Uh, and so so Kevin went to go and have a word with this guy and, and Kevin spoke Chinese and and in in that moment when he had that conversation kevin used a skill that we talked about in our coaching sessions called relating and um relating is all about understanding their stories and showing that you understand their stories now i, I have a framework called relate challenge resolve and relating is that part understanding their stories challenging is where you try to you try to change their stories and what a lot of people naturally do when they want to persuade people or change people's minds is they just go straight to challenging and they just say, you're wrong, I'm right. And here's all the reasons why I'm wrong, why I'm right and you're wrong. And that was something that, you know, Kevin naturally wanted to do, but he remembered the importance of relating. And so as he went to speak to this, this Chinese factory worker, he tried really, really hard to relate to him. And, and he said, look, I know, um, uh, I know we have really, really extreme safety standards, and I know it's a lot of hassle uh, trying to go to the other end of the factory to get a ladder. And, you know, if I were you, I'd probably want to find shortcuts as well. And look, I don't want to cause more trouble for you. And he was saying a lot of things like that to really relate to this factory workers motivations. And 
it, whereas previously he would have gone straight into challenging and said, you can't do that and pissed off the factory worker and caused that factory worker to rebel. Um, he related and he, he told me the next time he went to the factory and saw they needed light bulbs changing, uh, he actually saw them go and get a ladder. And one of the solutions Kevin came up with was actually to move the ladders closer to their desks so it was easier for them to change. Now, that that's just a really, really simple example. And I, I'm a big fan of the simplicity of storytelling. It doesn't have to be about telling a whole story. It, 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 what is equally important is about taking the individual skills and techniques from the field of storytelling and using them to, to influence change. And sometimes the change that you need to influence comes by simply relating to them more. Sometimes it comes by challenging their mindset and sometimes it comes by resolving the barriers to action um but that's just one simple example of how it's done and the i you know the the reason i like to start with that example is because relating is i think it's the most fundamental skill and the most overlooked skill and with the groups that i work with a lot of the time when we get to the heart of the problems that they're dealing with they realize the solution is spend a lot more time relating right let's go back and actually talk to these people Let, uh, i i don't think we really understand how they're feeling about this uh, a lot of the time it, it just starts with relating i think that's a really good good um good story and i think relate i like the the framework you explained there you just teased out the relates the challenge and then you resolve so that's that's quite ins insightful i think relate is something i can relate to a lot <laughs> because mm -hmm. working, uh, given uh, running lots of programs, change initiatives, a lot of times you you can't do anything really. You, your your role, your job is to get others to get things done. It's the way things get mm -hmm. done. You just need to inspire people, instruct people, motivate people to actually get things done. And the first step is investing the time so that they are on your side. So regard because whatever you plan, whatever you plan to do will not work out. So they need we need to collaboratively deal with the challenges. And as long as you invest the time up front, and it's actually counterintuitive. I've, I've gone through this before. I, I like the example you explained there. Sometimes it feels like, oh, I'm wasting time. We could be past mm -hmm. this by now. But really, mm -hmm. particularly with something that's really long term, you do need to invest the time to relate. So that's quite good. Um, based on that framework you've You've, ex you've explained, I think it's quite powerful. I, I just want to go a little bit deeper into that. So we've gone into relate to that example, the challenge, we saw the challenge. Can we tease out more about the resolve? How do you mm -hmm. resolve that? Um, that would be quite good to do. How do you resolve in this yeah. situation? So re resolve is actually my favorite part of the framework. Uh, I would say relate is the most important part and, and challenging is probably the part that most people are interested in. Uh, because that's where you, you know, you persuade people and get people to change their mind. But resolve is my favorite part because it, it's it, it's ultimately about removing friction. And I, uh, you know, a metaphor I like to use is that change is a journey and there's a destination and there's a path to the destination. And if I if I take a, a really, really <laughs> relatable example, let's say um, you know, trying to lose weight. And the destination is I will have lost 20 kilograms. And the path to the destination is I will do more exercise and I will go on a diet. But what nobody seems to talk about is the next step onto that path. And the next step is to find a way of exercising that you're motivated to do and to find a diet that works for you. And everyone knows what the final destination is. Everyone knows what they should do, but very few people know how to do it. And it's normally the how that gets people um, stuck. So if I if I go back to that factory example, um, and you know, using that phrase, I said removing friction. One of the challenges that Kevin saw in that factory was that the ladders really really far away from where the workers are based they have to work uh, walk almost the, the length of the factory floor and that's like several minutes of, of walking time so you know if it was me i probably wouldn't go and get a ladder if that was the case <laughs> that's a lot of friction 
Um, and in, in China, they, they have a word which they use all the time, which is mafan, which just means trouble. And um, anything that is mafan just doesn't get done. <laughs> um, and so uh, the, the resolve part in that situation is to bring the ladder closer to the desks. So there's there's no friction. So, you know, he ticked all of the boxes relating to him, saying, like, I get you. I, I don't want to cause more trouble for you. And when he went into the challenging part, he was saying along the lines of, look, I don't want you to get into trouble. <laughs> and I, and I, <laughs> I don't want to make trouble for you because we've signed a contract with your factory. And, you know, if you do this, you know, I have to go speak to my boss and I don't want to do that. So I don't want to get you into trouble. And then the resolve part is, look, I'll bring the ladder to you. And, you know, it, would that be OK? Could, could you, you know, if I put the ladder right here about five meters away, would that work? And that, that that's the resolve part. And in uh, so I, I work in the field of leadership development and learning and development um, and training. And, and I wrote a book several years ago about how to design and deliver practical training. Because as I was reading up about learning and development and training and instructional design, I was really surprised to see that no one was writing about behavior change. Um, everyone was writing about how you get people to know stuff, how you get people to remember stuff, how to engage people in workshops. But to actually learn about behavior change, I had to go to other fields and one of the fields that seems to know the most about this is the field of user experience design. Um, the people who design the apps on our phone, it turns out they are absolute masters of, of behavior change. They know how to get us to press the right button. And they, they use a lot of, um, a lot of uh, behavior design and behavior science. And I'd say the resolve part of my framework is all about that. And, and it's very, very relevant to leadership because the more friction you remove, the the more likely people are to just start doing things. Yeah, I think I think that, that's quite quite important. And I think giving that to your framework, so I can see why it's your favorite part, because it's actually how you get long lasting change, right? You don't do mm -hmm. something and then you just revert back to type. The example you gave of somebody going on a diet, you don't go through that journey, lose weight in a year, and two years you're back to where you were before. If you don't resolve. You don't stay in a new state. You just revert back to type. So definitely, it's probably the most powerful part at the end, how you sustain change. So it's a powerful, mm -hmm. and that just shows the power of storytelling. If, mm -hmm. we, if we take this powerful tool of storytelling and try and apply it to the, the main big challenges of our day. So this is more of a thought mm -hmm. experiment, more mm -hmm. a case of the big challenges we have today are things like we've got, energy crisis going on right now we've got mm. an eco economic ch um, challenge and these challenges when they manifest when they turn up they don't isolate themselves to the borders of a country mm. a global challenge turns up uh, sorry an economic crisis turns up it's it's global in nature as in, and the world is feeling it right now um energy crisis comes in it energy doesn't understand national borders it's it's a global challenge um, even though mm -hmm. a lot of the constructs we've created to deal with these challenges are national in nature, the challenges we need to deal with are global. Mm. Are there, what are your thoughts in applying storytelling to these kind of challenges? This, sometimes they're called um, difficult, they're really intractable challenges. What are your thoughts mm. in applying, uh, applying storytelling to these kind of wicked challenges? Mm hmm. hmm. Well, that's a that, that that's a difficult question to answer. My and I, I I don't have a streamlined answer, but I have several thoughts that come to mind. And one thought is that this really lies with the with the policy makers, I, I, I believe. And um, there's a lot of marketing trying to convince us that you know. If we if we buy a, a reusable bottle instead of buying plastic bottles all the time, then you know that that that's us doing our part. And you know, maybe that's true, but 
the reality is that kind of action, I, I imagine, and I'm not an expert, that kind of action is probably very minimum impact. Where the biggest impact lies is most likely with the policymakers who are dictating how countries are governing and what energy sources they're using and um, what packaging materials um, uh, corporations can use and so on. So I, I think it has to be focused on the policymakers to make the biggest impact. And I, I have a principle in in the story habit, in the challenging section, which is challenge the right people. And there's there's several ways of interpreting that. Um, one is that not everyone is going to agree with your idea. And so if you focus your persuasion efforts on the people who disagree with your idea, you're not really going to change their mind very, very much. But if you focus the people on uh, focus your efforts on the people who are more likely to agree with your idea, that's minimum effort, maximum impact and get those people first and then that can spread. So that's one way of thinking about challenge the right people. Another way of thinking about it is who are the people that can actually make a difference? And, you know, if you go out and persuade people to stop using plastic straws and stuff, is that really the right audience? I'm, you know, I'm not an expert, but I, I doubt that's the right audience. I, I would imagine it's the policymakers, uh, the, the leaders uh, who need to be challenged on that. Now, another thought, well, well two other thoughts that come to mind. Um, one, I, I think it's so complex and overwhelming. Um, and I, I think this is part of the issue, really. Uh, this is why storytelling uh, is so powerful, because it simplifies reality. Uh, and story is not reality. It's a simplified version of reality. And in any story that you listen to, uh, it's every single detail in the story is of significance. So if I say, this morning I got on the subway and I saw a man sitting opposite me and he was wearing a blue jacket. And then I started reading my book. I've told you about that man wearing the blue jacket. So he should be of some significance to the rest of the story, because if he's not, he's just noise in that story. Uh, and in when it comes to these big global issues of climate change and poverty, I think there's a lot of noise. Uh, there's a there's diverse viewpoints. There are um, uh, there are different ways of solving the problem. Um, probably the most uh, you know probably the most sustainable principle is sustainability. Just not using more than than what we what we have. That's probably ultimately yeah. what it comes down to, and that's probably what we should be focusing all of our solutions on. And one final thought is I, I think uh, we are told a story of terror about climate change and where the world is going. And I think that comes from uh, people with good intentions um, who don't really realize what they're doing because uh, terror kind of paralyzes people. It puts people in a state of fear. And you know, I think that it's not uncommon to have a conversation with someone who says, I don't want to have kids because why would I want to bring my kids into this world? And I, I don't think that's really a good way of solving problems. So whatever story you should, whatever story you tell, it should be something that instills confidence and hope rather than fear, uh, because fear just paralyzes people, whereas confidence and hope uh, inspires people. And it, as a simple um, a simple example with habits and sustaining change. Um, one of the things that a lot of people have heard about, you know, uh, about sustaining new habits is that, you know, it takes 21 days to sustain a new habit. And you do it 21 days, you've got a new habit. And uh, that is just not true. The science does not prove that at all. Uh, science shows that different people, different, uh, different people for the same habit take different amounts of time. What really sustains a habit is positive emotion. The reason smoking becomes a habit is because it makes you feel good. The reason eating junk food becomes a habit is because it makes you feel good. 
the reason people go for runs is because eventually it makes them feel good. And so if you yeah. really want people to sustain some kind of change, it has to make them feel good. Otherwise, it's it's not going to make them feel good. They're just going to be focused on getting away from the, from the pain that they're feeling. So I, I think challenge the right people, simplify things, just focus on one one idea and focus on the positive, not the negative. I think that's really good, actually. It's, like you said, it's a really complex challenge. And, you know, even though you, you said it yourself, nobody can really say and authoritatively have a clear train of thought how to deal with this. But simplifying the challenge with a very positive story will go a long way to removing the noise and moving the needle on some of these challenges that just seem beyond us, beyond our reach, beyond the ability for even nations to deal with. Just simplify the story, make it positive, and we can begin to see change. I think, no, thanks for, for sharing that. Um, if we change gears a little bit and take a look at the story of Jamie Dixon yourself, the storyteller. Mm -hmm. So you, um, you've got your back, you, you've already mentioned a lot of times, you've mentioned China. So you, you've lived in the UK and you currently live in China. And mm. given your work in leadership and development, in training, in working through stories, it would be good to get an insight as how has that experience of multiple countries, multiple cultures influence your work in storytelling mm. and understanding the power of stories? Mm. So let me give several examples. I remember one particular encounter on a subway in Shanghai. And this was within like my first four years in Shanghai, where, which were the most the angriest years of my life because I, I was not I was not really adapting to the new environment I was in. I was taking the stories that I had learned in the UK and I was using them to navigate China. And China is very different. And I, uh, one day I was having a very, very bad day. And as I was on the subway, there was this fat old lady who, um, as the subway was coming to, to a stop, she nudged me out of the way. And that really triggered me. And I got really, really angry. And I thought, ah, to hell with this. I'm getting my revenge. And I nudged her back. <laughs> and, and then in that moment, I suddenly thought, oh, my God, Jamie Dixon, this sweet little boy from Mid-Sussex, what, what has he become? He's just nudged an old lady on the subway. <laughs> and, and so I thought, oh, God, I, I should probably apologize to her. I, I shouldn't have done that. So I, I turned around to apologize to her. And as I looked at her face, it was as if nothing had happened. She didn't even register it. It wasn't, it wasn't an issue for her. And I realized in that moment, it was only an issue for me. It wasn't an issue for the other people who were doing it to me. And I realized that I had been interpreting it as pushing me out of the way and invading my personal space and practically assaulting me. But in that moment, I realized it's just another way of communicating. It's a gentle nudge, enough to grab my attention without distracting me from the book that I'm reading. Um, and, you know, it just lets them know that lets me know that they're trying to get by. And that was a really eye opening experience for me. It was from that moment that I realized that I, I should really try to learn a lot more about where I am. And from that moment, I started to ask why a lot more and actually seek answers. And you know, why do they behave that way? Why do they do that? Why? Why don't they do it this way? and actually seek answers. And I was amazed with all of the things I learned. And it really opened my mind and helped me learn new ways of living. And I feel very um, acclimatized to living in China now. I'm, uh, I, I'm fully adapted. I know how to, you know, I'm streetwise, you would say. I, <laughs> I know how to live over here. Uh, I know what to expect. And and that came from asking why and seeking answers. So that was probably a big eye opener to how story actually shapes our perspective. Um, I would say as well, another experience that I've had um, is reading the news about China 
and reading that it's this this terrifying dystopian state where uh, if you say the wrong word, you lose social credits and then you can't get on the train anymore and your bank account is frozen and, and all stuff like that. And I'd be reading articles like that. And then I go outside in China, walking around like, this couldn't be further from the truth. It's, it's not like that at all. But I noticed that those stories people were reading, even though they weren't really true, they were maybe just a, a fraction of the truth. They were having a very big influence on what people overseas were thinking. And it was very awkward for me when I had conversations with you know, family members and friends back home. And they say, why do you live in China? It's, oh, it's all of these horrible things. And why would you live there? And I'm like, it's not. And really struggling to get them to see that. And the um, a bit of a, a big part of the reason they didn't understand that is because they're not here and seeing is believing. And so that brings me to the final example, which is in the last two years in particular, I've been working with a lot of leadership teams here in China um, who are struggling because of exactly that reason. They are the leadership teams of the China office of whatever multinational company they work for. And they report to their leaders in Europe and the US. And they see the situation on the ground here in China. They see things changing all the time. And they see the need to adapt the company strategy so they can survive and compete. And so when they take their ideas and they go to their leaders in Europe and the US, uh, their leaders there aren't listening to them because they've already made up their mind about how things should work in China. And you know we can't trust our Chinese staff um, because of the politics. And we are very cautious about investing. And, you know, you're telling us that we should we should run our business in that way in China. That's not aligned with our brand. And and a big part of this breakdown in communication is because they're those Western leaders have just not come to China for the last few years. And instead, they've been influenced by the news that they've been reading. And, and you could argue that this is, um, you know, this is Western bias in action, but I would also argue that it's um, the Chinese authorities doing, I, I would say the worst example in the history of mankind of storytelling, having such amazing infrastructure, resources, talent, and technology to offer the world, and at the same time, making the world terrified of them. Uh, they're telling a terrible, terrible, terrible story about their country and that's their fault and they should do a better job of that and I, I strongly believe that so you know those are those are, are the examples of how how storytelling has been really been influencing my my life and my work especially in the last few years wow i think that is that's quite interesting actually and if, if I, and you can relate that in so many ways i know you use the example of countries two different complete cultures but if I look at an, analog an, an analogy and use that to relate to different industries, different companies, you see mm. that as well, where mm. a, a, a leader comes into a new organization and the first thing they say, in my old place, this is how we did it. This mm. is the day mm. we send the report. This is exactly how I structured my team, not realizing that they're in a different context. And in many mm. cases, like just you, the example you explained, they need to adapt. They need to understand mm. what is what works here. How do things actually work here? And how do you adapt your story to the reality on the ground? Um, so yeah. that, that is quite powerful. And it's, um, I, I was doing some study a, a few months ago about people and how they adapt to change as they get older. Mm. If you look at a lot of leaders, they are, they're older. And at that stage, learning is... By default, no longer their life. It can be an exception, but for many leaders, when you get into their sixties, learning and adapting to new things is no longer their life. So it's very easy to get into that mindset of, okay, mm. I was on a board of directors twenty years ago. Here, I'm going to do exactly the same thing in my mm. new context. Same example, mm. but they haven't adapted their story. What works here? 
Now, if you mm. layer that on top with different countries and different cultures, you get this really, really strange dynamic. And I think even within organizations, I worked in organizations where you have companies spread across different countries. I think just like the example you gave, and you can see this interesting dynamic between different offices. Like, okay, I think mm. they are trying to hold us back. I've been in a meeting where somebody said, I, we, we're not playing on the same team, same organization, same same division. Yeah. <laughs> but that's the feeling that we're not part of the same team. So it's quite insightful that it's a lot of times it's going back to relate, you challenge, and then you resolve. Mm -hmm. But you really do need to take the time to relate, to understand the context in which you, you're working. Um, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to go back to the story you gave of the the lady that pushed you <laughs> or mm. was it a push or was it a nudge or was it a shove <laughs> <All of my interpretation. laughs> <Yeah. laughs> um, so in, in the moment how and this is more of a person in the, in the moment how shocking was that and how mm. long did it take for you to resolve and learn was it instantly you saw the reaction and it was like okay this is something i need to learn or did it mm. take a while for you to reflect and and, and come to terms with that well, I think I think in that moment, I realized I need to be a lot more curious <laughs> about my surroundings. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that was the spark that made me curious. But like I was saying earlier, um, if you want to sustain a habit, it has to have something in it for you. It has to be a benefit for you. And so I can remember, you know, from that time onwards, I would just start to ask a lot of questions especially to my wife, who is Chinese. And, uh, you, you know, for example, sometimes you see old people spitting on the street and you think that's really uncivilized. And why do they do that? And then I'd go and ask someone and they'd say, well, the old people believe that better out than in. <laughs> and they're spitting out mucus and the mucus has dirty things and better out than in. And like, that kind of makes sense, actually. Not that I want to do that, but okay, I, I can now understand why they do that. And, you know, why do they rush around and, and jump queues? And well, these people were born during the Cultural Revolution. And if they didn't fight at that time, they, they wouldn't eat. And OK, that kind of makes sense. So I, as I'd start to ask questions like that, I get answers like that. And the insight that I got from those answers was the benefit that I, that I could feel. And that kind of sustained that change from there. So it was one spark that created a new motivation and that led to action. And then the benefit of that action sustained that change over time. I, I, I think that's that's how it worked, basically. Wow. Okay. No, nice. Um, if we move on to, we now know the power of stories. You explained that brilliantly. How can anybody listening, watching, get into the story habit? How can we learn, improve? and sustain the story habit what what tips would you give mm. well um my favorite tip and um you've probably heard this if you've heard me on on other podcasts is 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 to notice change um and because when you notice the changes that happen in your life those become the stories in your story pool and then you take those stories out of your story pool and you tell them at the at any opportune moment you have first time you tell it it's not going to be very good but you get feedback from people they laugh at certain parts or they get confused at other parts and then you can refine it and improve it from there so that that is how to start building the story uh, the story habit i there's one thing i, I want to emphasize about the the relate challenge resolve framework is that for example relating is really important, the most important part, and is something a lot of leaders don't do. And if you can learn to get really, really good at relating, that's fantastic. But don't stop there. Um, also learn how to challenge people. I notice a lot of like, um, uh, what do we call them? Snake oil salespeople, these gurus who, who, um, who say they can help you get rich they just relate without challenging you. They, uh, if you ever, you know, you're on, you're on YouTube and suddenly this advert comes up and says, hey, I used to be just like you and 
I really, really wanted to be really, really rich. And I found this way of making loads and loads of money by doing drop shipping on Amazon or something like that. All they're doing is, is they're relating to you. They're relating to your desire to, to, to make money, but they're not challenging your beliefs. They're not, they're not challenging your beliefs about the reality of making money. Making money is hard. It's not easy. Uh, and so they're trying to relate to you and they're, they're trying to manipulate you that way. What a good leader does is they also challenge people and they push people out of their comfort zones and they do it to themselves as well. Like you were describing with those senior leaders in their senior le uh, senior years who have stopped growing, it's because they didn't challenge themselves. They stopped challenging themselves and they've just stayed in their comfort zone. And um, now that causes all sorts of problems for them because the world is a very different place to what they are, uh, um, what they are uh, conditioned to. So if you want to be a good leader, you also need to learn how to challenge yourself and how to challenge others. And, you know, the resolve part uh, is my favorite part. But the thing I want to emphasize there is you also have to get good at challenging people, uh, not just stopping at relating. I think that's what that's what makes a real leader. They really help challenge people and help people grow. So, yeah, that, that would be how, I, how I'd say you can start practicing the story habit get good at relating to people, but then remember to challenge them as well, especially if you're their leader, because you really need to help people grow and you need to do it yourself as well. Really good. I, I like that you need to notice the change, learn to really relate, invest the time, relate, and don't stop there. Like you said, you need to challenge people so they move forward, they continue to grow, get out of your comfort zone. And you can only do it by example, like you, you, you brilliantly said there as well. So that's really good. Um, just in closing, it would be good to know, you know, how can people, you know, watching this, listening to this, how can they get in touch with you? Also, is there anything interesting you're doing you'd like to share uh, in the final minutes we've got? Mm. Well, yeah, if anyone else would like to get in touch or know more, I'm quite active on LinkedIn. So you can find me on LinkedIn. Just look for Jamie Dixon, D-I-X-O-N, uh, and uh, you can see my face on an orange background. Um, you can also go to thestoryhabit.com where you can learn a bit more about the story habit. And actually, there's a free online course that I have for the story habit. Um, so if you go to onlinecourse.thestoryhabit.com, you will find that there um, completely free. There is a paid version as well, but there's a free version which you, you can feel free to take. Uh, so, yeah, those are some ways to uh, learn a bit more. And of course, the book, The Story Habit, is available on Amazon as well. So you can also check that out there. Yeah. Thank you. Perfect. Perfect. What I'll do is I'll put the links to your, your LinkedIn and to your website in the show notes. So anybody who's either watching or listening can easily get in touch with you. Um, Jamie, this has been really good, very insightful, a lot of information, a lot of insights, uh, a, a lot of guidance on how we can get better at get into the story habits and making the most of the power of story. So thank you so much for taking the time to share this. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Would you like to learn more about the story habits? Would you like to join in the conversation on how to inspire change through storytelling? Connect with a community of like-minded leaders on our website, thechangelead.com. When you visit the site, Click join to join the community. Also, check out the show notes for details on how you can contact today's guest, Jamie Dixon. As always, please don't forget to like, comment, review and subscribe. Thank you very much for tuning in. Have a great week and see you next time.